Okay, so in this presentation, we're going to go over genetic pedigrees, how to read them, how to analyze them, how to construct them. So let's go ahead and get started. So my goal is by the end, if I were to give you a pedigree like this, you would be able to identify the individual genotypes. Every circle or square represents a person, and again, we all have genotypes, gene combinations. And so I'm hoping by the end you can solve this pedigree right here. Now let's go ahead and get started. So when we look at a genetic pedigree, they're very similar to family trees because they show relationships. You know, in this picture here, we have a, 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 man, a man and a woman, and I have a branch connecting them to a young lady that was, that's their child. And as the years go by, she meets this gentleman right here. Maybe they both enjoy uh, gardening together. And uh, a relationship between them uh, starts, and, and they end up having two children. And so genetic pedigrees are very much like family trees. You know, a very common activity you probably did in elementary school was build a family tree. Uh, it, it was a way for you to get to know some of your family members a little bit better. Well, a genetic pedigree is very much like a family tree because they show relationships. But more importantly, we look at pedigrees because it allows us to track a gene or it allows us to track a trait throughout a family. If a family has a history of a trait such as, uh, such, such as sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, we can track that person or we can track that gene from person to person to person throughout the family, which can be really helpful when, uh, when uh, young men and young women are deciding whether or not they want to raise a family. They can figure out the odds that their child might have a disorder. So here we have an example of a pedigree. It's that same pedigree we saw. Now notice how there are various symbols. The circles, and anytime you see a pedigree, the circles represent women, and the squares represent men. Now notice how some of the circles and squares are shaded in. In this case, they're shaded blue. What that means, whenever you see a pedigree that's shaded, that means that that person has a trait. Again, usually that's going to mean they have a gene disorder, a genetic disorder. So perhaps person 1, 10, and 12 have the disorder of you know, sickle cell disease. But that's generally what these symbols mean. So if you were to examine this pedigree and I were to ask you, in which individuals are males? Pause the answer, I'm going to show it in 3, or pause the video, I'm going to show it in 3, 2, 1. So I hope you found individual 2, 3, 5, 7, 10, 11, and 13 are all males because they're squares. Well, here's another question. Which individuals are female? Pause the video. I'm going to go over the answers in 3, 2, 1. So I hope all you had to do was identify the circles. Circle 1, 4, 6, 8, 9, and 12 are females. And this question right here, which individuals in this family have a genetic disorder? I'm going to go over the answers, so pause the video. I'm going to show the answers in 3, 2, 1. I hope you chose these three people, person 1, 10, and 12. These three people have a genetic disorder. Well, we're going to go over some examples today, so why don't we get started with our first example. So we're going to examine a fictional family using a disease known as PKU as the example in this particular family. In the picture, you can see that a blood test is being done on an infant. PKU is a disease that stands for phenylketonuria. And what we do is when, when, a, when a newborn baby is born, we'll take a blood sample. And based on how bacteria react to that blood sample, we can determine if a person has PKU. Okay, so let's go ahead and meet this fictional family. So here we have a man and a woman, and I want to, I want to go over the pattern for this particular video. We're going to focus on PKU, which is a disease that is autosomal recessive. When a man and a woman have a child, there, is, there are four possible gene combinations. That's why whenever you do a Punnett square, there's four Punnett squares to fill in because there's four different ways that these genes can combine. That's why we have 
uh, this man and a woman, and then four babies. So the first possibility, the baby might inherit a capital dominant H from the father, a capital dominant H from the mother. This individual would be homozygous dominant. They'd be healthy. The next possible combination would be this right here. They might, in, they might inherit a capital H from the father and a lowercase h from the mother. This combination is called heterozygous. This person would also be healthy, but they would be what's called a carrier. A third possible combination, they might inherit a lowercase h and a capital, a lowercase h from the father and a capital H from the mother. This too is also called heterozygous. It doesn't matter if you put the capital or the lowercase letter first, but it's a good habit to put the capital letter first, so I'm going to do that right now. And so the last combination that a child might inherit might be a lower H from each parent. This would be called homozygous recessive. And when you look at these four possible outcomes right here, these are called genotypes, you can see that only one out of the four, there's only a one in four chance that this mom and dad could have a child with the disease PKU. Those other three children, uh, those other three gene combinations are all healthy. So let's go ahead and meet our fictional family. Okay, so here we go. We're going to actually create a pedigree here based on some information about a fictional family. And like the last example, we're going to pretend that this family has a history of a disease called PKU. And so Manny and Rosa, man and woman, let's keep this family friendly, and they're both married and they're both healthy. So notice how I drew a square for Manny because Manny implies a male's name, and a circle for Rosa because Rosa implies a woman's name. And so I connected the circle and the square, that implies that they're together. And so this is what we typically see of a married man and woman. You don't have to be married, of course, to have a child, but let's keep this family friendly. So second step, pretend that they have three children over the years. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw three branches coming down from Manny and Rosa. At the end of each branch will soon be a child. It says their oldest child, Jacob, has a recessive disorder called PKU. So first of all, you generally put the oldest child on the left. So I have a square there for Jacob because Jacob implies a boy's name. But the, the statement also tells me that Jacob has a recessive disorder called PKU. He has the disease. So that's why I'm going to color in Jacob's square. Typically when you see someone colored in, that means they have the disorder. They have the gene. Moving on. Their middle child, Erica, and their youngest child, Matthew, are both healthy. So Erica implies a circle for a girl. And again, uh, you typically put the oldest on the left and therefore the youngest on the right. So Matthew is, implies a boy's name. And so I have a square there. Well, let's go ahead and pause and, and let's go ahead and, and stop and try to figure out what are the genotypes of these five people so far. I know Jacob has to be homozygous recessive, two lowercase h's, because that's the only combination possible of having the disease PKU. The other four people are healthy, so there's a problem there. The other four people are healthy, and there's two possible gene combinations. There's two possible genotypes that lead to healthy. I've got to figure out which genotype are they. So first of all, when I want to figure out what, geno what genotype they are, let's start with Manny and Rosa, mom and dad. I know Jacob has the disease. Well, we get our DNA, we inherit our traits from mom and dad. So Jacob has two lowercase h's. One of those had to come from each parent. The story never tells me Manny and Rosa were heterozygous. But because Jacob has the disease, he has to be heterozygous. I can cross out homozygous dominant. So now that I know Manny and Rosa, why don't I build a Punnett square? Let me build a Punnett square in the upper right-hand corner for Manny and Rosa. There's the genotype for Manny. There's the genotype for Rosa. And now I just fill in the Punnett square, the top left square, the top right square, the lower left square, the lower right square. And when I do, I can see Erica and Matthew clearly are not the square in the bottom right-hand corner. They're not homozygous recessive because they would have the disease. I know they're healthy. 
So right now I'm kind of stuck with Erica and Matthew. I don't know their exact genotype. They're either capital H, capital H, there's a one out of three chance of that, or they're capital H, lowercase h. There's a two out of three chance of that, but I don't know for sure. So let's move on. Moving on with our little fictional family here. Erica goes away to college, and while at college, she meets healthy, a healthy gentleman by the name of Mo, and the two become married. So well, there we go. We just inserted Mo, and we connected him to Erica, implying that they're together. Erica and Mo end up having two daughters, so I'm going to make a branch with two ends, and daughters implies I'm going to uh, draw circles, two circles for, for women. Their youngest daughter, Jamie, tests positive for the disease PKU, but Amy does not. So again, the youngest is on the right, the oldest is on the left. So I'm going to color in the circle on the right for Jamie, and I'm going to leave the circle on the left blank for Amy. Just like last time, let's go ahead and record the genotypes of Erica, Moe, Amy, and Jamie. So let's go ahead and look at Jamie. Jamie has to be homozygous recessive. She has two lowercase h's. It's the only way she can have the disease. That's the only possible combination. Well, where did she get those two lowercase h's from? Okay, before we address Jamie and how she got those two lowercase h's, I know Mo is healthy. There's two possible combinations for healthy. And I know Amy's healthy. The story tells me Amy's health, healthy. So there's two possible combinations for Amy. Well, now let's turn our attention back to Jamie. Jamie is a big clue here. Jamie has the disease. She's got two lowercase h's. Well, where did those come from? We get our DNA from mom and dad. One of those lower h's had to come from mom. One of those lower h's had to come from dad. I now know that Mo has to be heterozygous, and I now have missing information about Erica. I used to not know Erica. Erica used to have a question mark, but because Jamie was born, we now have more information that gives us the, the that sheds light onto the onto the question of what is Erica's genotype. She has to be heterozygous. Moe's heterozygous again for that same reason. So let's go ahead like last time. Let's do a Punnett square in the upper right hand corner. And there's the letters for Erica on the outside of the Punnett square. There's the letters for Mo. And like last time, we just fill in the top left, fill in the top right, fill in the bottom left, fill in the bottom right. And when we look at our finished Punnett square, I know Amy is not the square in the lower right hand corner. She's not homozygous recessive because I know the story tells me she's healthy. You see my problem. Just like Matthew in the diagram, I don't know Amy's genotype. There's a one out of three chance that she's homozygous dominant, capital H, capital H. There's a two out of three chance that she's homozygous, excuse me, two out of three chance that she's heterozygous, capital H, lowercase h. All I know, she's healthy. So there you go. There's a, a very quick and simple uh, pedigree analyzing a fictional family. I want to give you another practice. So now that we just got done with that example, there's going to be another family on the next slide. This family, pretend, has a history of sickle cell disease. Just like PKU, it's autosomal recessive. You have to inherit two lowercase h's. So here we go. So here we have a bunch of people in this family. Pause the video. Pause the video and try to figure out the genotypes of everybody. Notice the hint in the upper left hand corner. You will not be able to solve three people in this family. I'm not going to tell you who until the end. Pause the video. I'm going to start going over the answers in three, two, one. So to get started, start with the four symbols that are shaded in. They have to be lowercase h, lowercase h, homozygous recessive because that means they have the disease. So already four people out of this family are finished. Let's move on. Next, everybody else, everyone who's not colored in, I know they're healthy. They're healthy because they're not colored in. So I'm going to go ahead and give everybody else one capital H because I know they're healthy. Maybe they have another capital H, maybe not, but I know they have at least one. Okay, let's focus on 
George. George has to be heterozygous. How do we know that? There's actually two clues, two ways we can figure out George. Clue number one, if George was capital H, capital H, if George was homozygous dominant, he would give every one of his children a capital H. He would give Tom, Sam, Wilma, and Ann a capital H, and therefore none of the kids would have the disease. Another way we know George is heterozygous is look at two of his children. Tom and Wilma are his, ch are his children. They each have the disease, and they each have two lowercase h's. One had to come from mom, Arlene. The other had to come from dad, George. All right, now I want you to focus on Sam and Ann. Sam and Ann must be heterozygous. How do we know that? Well, here's the answer. Arlene, their mother, is the clue. Arlene has two lowercase h's. That means whoever, or whoever is born from Arlene, whoever is Arlene's child is going to get a lowercase h from her. She's got four children, Tom, Sam, Wilma, and Ann. The next person I want you to focus on is Michael. Michael has to be heterozygous, capital H, lowercase h. How do we know that? Well, we know that because of his daughter. His daughter, Carla, is the clue. She has the disease, so she must have inherited one lowercase h from his, uh, her mother, Anne, and the other lowercase h from her father, Michael. Okay, now I want you to focus on Daniel and Alan. Daniel and Alan also must be heterozygous, capital H, lowercase h. How do we know this? The clue is their father. Their father, Tom, is the clue. Tom has two lowercase h's. He's going to pass on a lowercase h to any of his children. He happens to have two children only named Daniel and Alan. So Tom's going to give a lowercase h to all of his children. And so now there's only three people left. My hint was that three people are going to be unknown. And so that's why I added question marks to Sandra, Tina, and Christopher. How do we know that they're unknown? Because all we know is that they're healthy. We don't know what combination of healthy they are. Homozygous dominant, capital H, capital H, or homozygous recessive, capital H, lowercase h. So there you go. I hope that was a good, uh, a good, a good review or, or a good explanation for how to build a pedigree. If you want, pause the video. And I was uh, one of the goals at the beginning was that you would be able to solve these 13 people. Uh, pause the video and, and try to and try to finish these. If you're in my biology class, I'd be happy to check your answers for accuracy. Bring them to me before school or after school, and I'd be happy to check. Good luck.